meeting session, we welcome Professor Mukesh Ranjan. Professor Mukesh Ranjan is professor at the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, sir, you're unmuted now. You're unmuted. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, am I audible? Yes, am sir, I you audible? are. You are, you are. Okay, yes, thank sir, you. you Faizan, Fe we'll just give a brief introduction uh, to you and then we'll proceed. Yeah, please, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Professor Mukesh Ranjan is professor at the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islami. His areas of interest are poetry, post-colonial and translation studies, literary criticism and theory, and Indian poetics. He is the author of The Wasteland Architectonics of Conceptual Structures, published by Books Plus in 1998. With respect, over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Faizan. You know, uh, so I welcome you know the speaker for this you know session. You know, Dr. Nilesh, you know, Bose. Uh, so Dr. Bose uh, is an associate. He's an associate professor of history and Canada Research Chair of uh, Global and Comparative History at the University of you know Victoria. His interests you know include you know colonialism, religion, uh, secularism and vernacular literary and cultural studies. Uh, Dr. Bose would speak on you know, vernaculars across texts, modern Islam and modern literature in Bengal. So may I request you know, prof, uh, Dr. Bose uh, to make his you know, presentation, please. Thank you uh, very much to all who uh, have uh, invited me and to everybody in the audience and everyone who has labored to make this happen. I have a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation, and may I uh, share the screen at this point? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Bose, you know, before you get started with your presentation, I believe you are aware of the format. Uh, for the first 20 minutes, you know, is devoted to presentation, and the last 10 minutes, uh, we would use up, you know, answering, you know, there would be a question yes. answer session. Yes. So I would be very particular about, you know, the timing. So uh, please, uh, sir, go ahead and make your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Thank Bose, you. would you want us to share your PPT? That is fine. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you uh, for the, um, again, invitation and everybody who is here. Uh, today I will speak about vernacularization. And as all of you uh, and many of the esteemed speakers have already discussed, is of course an important element in literary uh, criticism and literary studies of South Asia. Its importance is beyond dispute. However, the role of the vernacular condition as a model for understanding religion, as in particular the history of Islam in South Asia, has yet to appear uh, fully in tandem with studies of literary history. Uh, this paper that I'll share today aims to tie together the field of the history of religion and the history of the Bangla language through a look at Islam in Bengal from its first uh, translation of Quran in vernacular Bangla in the 1880s to the poetry of Nojul Islam and especially his poems in the 1920s, which fuse Islam into a larger framework of a global vision. And this I'm arguing draws from a broader tradition um, of thinking of uh, religion in a register within the vernacular vernacularization of Islam and Islamization of Bangla uh, belong in the same framework is what I will suggest uh, by the end of today. So first, and uh, we may move to the next slide, I'll speak briefly on the history of Islam in Bengal. By most historical accounts, uh, Islam entered via the conquests of the Turkic Kilji tribesmen Bakhtiar in the early 13th century, who had conquered parts of Eastern India um, attacks on Buddhist monasteries in Bihar, as well as conquest of Nobodip and Gore um, led to the beginning of Islam. However, there is suggestive evidence that Islam existed in Bengal before the rise of Kilji as the material remains and folk uh, tradition points to the existence of a mosque uh, built in Lal Munir Hat in northern Rongpur in the 8th century in what is now Bangladesh as well as the presence of Arabs uh, in Arakan and Chittagong between the 8th 
and the 13th centuries, offering a perspective of Islam as being coterminous with the history of Bengal. Uh, Bengal re remained uh, under the rule of the Delhi Sultanate until 1342, at which time uh, there was an independent Bengal Sultanate uh, under the rule of Sultan Ilya Shah. And from the 14th century to the 16th century, Bengal was transformed into an independent political entity with its own uh, forms of architecture, as well as religious practice and memorialization of saints coming from different parts of the Muslim world. As these two structures I am uh, demonstrating here show from Pandua and what is now West Bengal in India. Tied to this process was the growth of literature in Bengali a little later in time intended as instruction for readers about proper form of religious practice. Such works uh, termed Nasihat Namas were composed from the 16th century onward. They used at times Arabic words uh, as well as terms from Sanskrit um, and literature that preached Islam within Bangla begins to emerge uh, from the 16th century onward. But there is no full translation of the Quran until the 19th century as I will discuss. To the next slide, when we get to the period of company uh, and imperial rule from the middle of the 18th century, Bengal was the home of a, a range of reformist movements in line uh, with modern forms of religiosity and politics ushered in uh, by various forces within India and outside of India. Men such as uh, Haji Shariat Allah here, who dies in 1840 from Puritpur in Eastern Bengal, studied in Makkah and also in Al-Azhar uh, between 1799 and 1818, returns into Bengal uh, at that time and began to critique allegedly Hindu practices such as praying and worshiping at dargahs and other related practices. He, and especially his son, uh, nicknamed Dudu Meya, who dies in 1862, continued the movement to identify certain practices as outside of the realm of Islam. Uh, this continues in the 1830s and 1840s and fuses with a explicitly peasant movement that aimed to curtail the abuse of Muslim ten, uh, riots against uh, Hindu uh, landlords. In the early 20th century, as a small but increasingly visible Muslim middle class developed in Bengal, Muslims began to take new jobs available uh, in business, in universities, and in the government. They also began to produce new journals and newspapers in Bangla, suggesting proper Muslim practices and criticizing Christian missionary practices. This allowed for a space of the discussion of Muslim community in the uh, popular press, as I have shown an image here of, of uh, the periodical Al-Islam. It is just before this stage, uh, after several centuries of Muslim presence in Bengal, again, some claim coterminous with the history of Islam itself, um, that a figure like Girish Chandra Shen enters the history of Islam in Bengal. And now we get to the next slide. Uh, this person was born in 1834, uh, sorry, 1835 in Narayanganj in Eastern Bengal. And he learned both Farsi from his uncle uh, who worked in different capacities in Moimunshing uh, for uh, formal authorities, as well as learned Sanskrit as a child. And he taught um, in schools in Moimunshing and in, in, this is in Eastern Bengal, what is now Bangladesh, as well as other schools in his home uh, district, but comes to Calcutta in the 1870s. And he lives in the ashram of Keshav Chandra Shen, who was the then leader of the Brahma Shamaj a reformist movement that saw itself as not Hindu, but as building a new religion uh, out of the synthesis of the various religions of the world. And this approach to synthesizing religions starts back in the 1820s with Ramahun Roy who, and others who sought to soak up knowledge and wisdom from all of the religions of the world. There's a detailed history of the Brahma Shamaj that I may discuss if there's interest later. But at this point in time, uh, Girish Chandra Shen, coming from the Mofashal regions of East Bengal, appears in Calcutta. He is then assigned the task to go uh, and study Islam by Keshav Chandra Shen, who is the uh, head of the Brahma Shamaj at this time. He goes to Lucknow to learn Arabic and studies there for approximately four years. He learned Arabic and Persian from one Molvi, Eshan Ali, and then also learned Arabic grammar 
and traveled in between Lucknow and uh, Dhaka uh, throughout the rest of the 1870s. Um, and he produces a great deal. I'll speak of that in a minute. And he dies in 1910. He wrote 44 books in Bangla. He also wrote in Urdu uh, seven books. And in Bangla, he wrote primarily about religion. Uh, one of his books is titled Dharma or Niti, 1873. He also translated quite a bit into Bangla, including Tazkirat Aulia. He also wrote a book called Niti Mala uh, and uh, wrote biographies. He wrote a biography of Ram Mohan Roy in uh, Bangla and a biography of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, Muhapurush Muhammad in 1886. He also wrote a bit that has not yet been found. Uh, he refers to books that he wrote after he started to research Islam. One book is called Ishor Ki Ishor, which means is God God. Another book is called Prokriti Dharma or Natural Religion, and this has not yet been found. So on to the Quran. After five years of labor, of learning Arabic and uh, working with uh, teachers, he published the Quran first from Moimun Shing. In 1881, this is images from the next version, which comes out in 1882. Um, as many scholars have argued, at this time, most Ashraf Muslims regarded the translation of the Quran as bishara or an irreligious act. And this, therefore, allowed Girish Hundur Shen a certain space. He translated this not as a Muslim, also not as Hindu. Um, but as a century before Shen's work emerged, Noted theologian Shah Waliullah of Delhi translated the Quran into Persian in 1737. And Girish Hundur Shen comes over a hundred years later and does this in Bangla. He's the first person to do this full as a full text uh, in Bangla. Second volume was published in 1882 and then again in 1908 and then fourth after his death. All of them were published after the first in Calcutta, all of them for a thousand copies each. They were read primarily by Brahmos, uh, but they were also read by others, uh, interested members of Calcutta society, uh, some uh, Muslims and some uh, uh, from various groups. It earned him the praise as well as the condemnation uh, of Muslims uh, in the early 20th century. In his preface, he mentions how translation into Bangla is very difficult. And he relied on particular tafsir, which he, says that others who had worked with Quranic translation in India had also worked with Tafsir Hosseini, Tafsir Faida, and Jalalin. And he mentions this in his preface as a way to signal that he is a part of a legitimate activity of working with those who came before him. There are others who translate Quran into Indian languages, but Abdullah Sindhi, Saeed Ahmad Khan, he is the only one who is doing this neither as Muslim nor Hindu, and not uh, as a part of any broader ref uh, project within a existing religion. Um, he uses Bangla terms such as Ishor for God in Surah Fatiha, as well as in the Bismillah, which he includes at the top of each surah. He includes a page long note that discusses this choice. And he states in his first edition, 1881, this is for all Bangla readers to understand uh, what is happening in this book. Uh, he also uses Porameshwar and Odipoti um, in each of his versions, 1881, 1882, 1908, 1936. Um, this has been excised from editions that were published later in Bangladesh, something I may discuss if there is time. What is new is not so much the Quran in Bangla. There were, uh, examples of this before, but they were not in vernacular Bangla. They were in so-called Dobhashi or Punti uh, Bhashi uh, uh, Bangla uh, that it existed in earlier times. Also, there were poems that were written before that were inspired by particular surahs. Um, Shah Muhammad Shagir, who wrote about Surah Yusuf, and then plenty of people were aware of Surah Fatiha and wrote about them, but not in this context. In 1808, uh, we find the first full-scale Quran, but it is in Punti Bhashi, and that is by Umaruddin Bushuniya, and it is not meant uh, or was not even made aware of to, to Brahmos or anyone else. Shen is the first to make this accessible to a broader audience. After he did his, between then and 1947, there are 67 translations of the Quran into Bangla, uh, primarily by Muslims. 
The first is by Naimuddin. Um, he, though, does use Arabic words. Uh, he uses the term Allah in Surah Fatiha, and he does not use any of the terms that Girish Chandra Shen did, but he acknowledged him as the first to do this. There were many others who also followed in the wake of Girish Chandra Shen. One Philip Bishash, who was a Christian, one Reverend Goldsack, also a Christian, and there were Hindus, uh, Sri Kiran Gopal Shingho, and also another Brahmo, Didash Dotto, uh, did another Quran in 1926. Um, so by the time that we get to the rise of Nojul Islam, who I will speak of in a minute, there are several examples of the Quran in uh, vernacular Bangla. So uh, his efforts come about uh, a century after different Muslim reformist activity had been uh, in, in place. So from Shah Waliullah to Shah Abdul Aziz, his son, Deoband Madrasa also, and many other individual Muslims. But he is not doing this uh, from a Muslim political interest. He is not doing it as Hindu. He is doing it as a Brahmo. And he is offering a context to understand who comes later in this endeavor, which is Nojul Islam. Nojul Islam uh, is somebody who also does a translation of the Quran in 1933, but he uh, includes Arabic terms. He does not include uh, the word Ishor anywhere in the Quran in terms of the surahs. But as we shall see, there are other places where Nojul Islam is following in Girish Chandra Shen's footsteps uh, to the next uh, slide. Uh, about this person, Nudul Islam, as many of you probably know, uh, he born in 1899 in rural Bengal, comes to Calcutta as an adult also. And there is a parallel to the way that this works between him and uh, Girish Chandra Shen. He has been studied primarily in terms of literary criticism and cultural history. He uh, volunteers for and then joins the war effort, though he goes only as far west as Karachi, and he is there in 1917 and 18 and meets a whole variety of people. He is born in a nominally Muslim community, comes back and starts writing uh, intensively after World War I, primarily in Calcutta uh, in the interwar period. He produced an explosion of works, um, original composition of music for stage and screen, poetry and prose. Uh, he wrote prose criticism, including uh, an essay in 1933 called Modern World Literature, um, and from the end of the 1920s, worked in cinema, working as a song and music writer and director and Calcutta radio. He retained localized Hindu and Muslim themes and a broader internationalist vision in his work that starts primarily from 1920s. And I suggest that his ethos drew from the Brahmo Shamaj's long legacy of which Girish Chandra Shen is a major marker. In the 1920s, he starts to write about a variety of issues, most of which is political formally, but has a variety of religious references. He, like Girish Chandra Shen and before him, Ram Mohan Roy, was a reader of Persian and also a reader of Darashiko. And he references this in his works in 1920s. He saw a range of poems that he had published in the 1920s. Uh, Korbani, for example, and Dhumketu. Dhumketu is a poem that landed him in jail in the mid 1920s, partially because he writes about the Hindu and Muslim end times uh, together. And this is a theme that he carries off throughout the entirety of the decade. He uses ap apocalyptic imagery from Hindu and Muslim reference points as well throughout most of his poetry in 1920s. About the vernacular in text between religion and creative expression, it is impossible to draw any clear lines. We know that Nojul accessed Ramahun Roy's work in Bangla. We know that he likely read Girish Chandra Shen's Quran, though we don't know um, if for that, we don't have proof for that, but it's most likely that he did. He studied uh, in a very similar way to Girish Chandra Shen. He did not have formal training uh, educationally, but he studied uh, on his own and devoured the classics through his own interest. This would place him in a Brahmo tradition. He repeats uh, throughout the 1920s, this phrase that Brahmo Shamaj used uh, from the early 19th century called Ekam uh, Tyam, loosely translating to uh, uh, what one beyond any other, uh, one God is how it would be understood in English, which is used 
from 1828. And at the end, uh, near the end of his life, uh, as a writer, he wrote uh, an article called Amar Lee Congress, a response to Muslim communalists who attacked him for various reasons. And he wrote that he saw Allah alone as the king of kings in the world, but he also described him as one without second, which is something that he retains uh, from his exposure to Brahmo works. In the late 20s, he worked for his master's voice as a lyricist and a composer, and he focused on music that drew upon a Brahmo tradition of seeing and engaging with devotional content from a variety of religious uh, sources. Uh, from Islam, uh, songs about namaz, roja, and hajj, also from Hindu sources, including Shama Shongit and devotional songs to Kali. And in his poems in the 1920s, he draws on repeated references to Ramayan and different aspects of Hinduism. He also published uh, approximately 800 songs uh, during this time period, late 20s, early 1930s. And finally, uh, since the World War I moment, Though he was rooted in the Bangla, we could say vernacular, he was all, always interested in the world outside of, uh, of the world that he knew um, uh, from his time in World War I. He wrote about the world of Islam, uh, really from his imagination uh, through different poems, Shati al-Arab, Khalid and Kamal Pasha, which emerged in the mid 1920s. He recounts the sacrifices of Muslims and the physical geography of a world known uh, through Islam spread out through the globe. Uh, and he writes about how Arabian dates had been consumed uh, on Eid, but they have been enjoyed by those uh, who eat rice and dal and, and fish. In Shatil Arab, he mentions the bones of, quote, Arab, Egyptian, Turk, Greek, and Bedouin, and the, quote, crimson flame-like uh, roses of Basra, the radiant emblems of war and glory, they flourish on soil where heads have tumbled forever glorious, forever holy. And I'll end with a mention of the work that is pictured here, Shammobadi, loosely translated as uh, egalitarian. In this book, which includes 11 poems, it uh, starts with Shammobadi, uh, the person, uh, Shammobadi, the person proclaiming equality, and ends with Shammo, or equality. In the middle is a poem about God, and God here, the term used is Ishor, a term that Girish Shundar Shen also used uh, in his Quran. And in each line, it is adorned, each page rather adorned with the line, Gai Sham Mergan, Sham Mergan Gai. And the sentiment at the end of the poem, uh, one emphasized by Brahmo since Ramahun Roy and reiterated by many ever since, ends by stating that what I've heard is no lie, Mitta Shunini Bhai, that there is no Baba no temple bigger than the heart. And this is another way, another uh, approach to describing uh, the religion of the vernacular uh, in a uh, Bengali register. And this is where I will end my presentation and thank you for your time and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bose, you know, for concluding bang on time. You know, thank you so much. Uh, so now I would request, uh, you know, uh, participants, you know, to ask a you know, question because now we move to the question answer session. Thank you, Professor Mukesh Ranjan. I'll be doing the moderating the Q&A session. Please, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Bose. That was indeed a very stimulating session. I mean, it was truly enlightening uh, for everyone, I believe. Um, now I'll start with the Q&A session. So this, the first question is from uh, Nandini Kalita. It says, I was wondering if translation of different religious texts in Bengali led to the incorporation of new concepts in the language that did not exist earlier. We see this happening in the Assamese context. Your response, please. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. And there is a discussion in the field of literary criticism about that very issue for Bangla. And there are some who argue that because of the presence uh, of Islam, there was a push to create new conceptual registers to re reference what had not been available uh, before. On the other hand, there are some who argue that it is only because the language uh, was so um, wide ranging that it was able to handle uh, the ability of, to incorporate uh, the presence of Islam. And so I think there are debates about this question. I, I would say 
that I would err on the latter, that uh, even though there have been moments when people have been struggling to represent something new that had not been represented before, there are many texts in the history of Bangla, one studied by the scholar Tony Stewart who, about this text uh, by Ali Raja in the 18th century, who argues that there are many registers in Bangla to represent different concepts. It is simply that people had not seen them before, but they existed. They were simply activated by uh, the presence uh, of new forms and new people. So uh, I, would, uh, I would say that as a response. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, we have two questions from Professor um, Nusab Zaidi. I'll combine them both. Uh, this is very interesting indeed, Dr. Bose. I'm also thinking of Patendu Harishchandra's piece on Islam in Panch uh, Pavitratma, in which he calls Mahatma Muhammad. Was there a link between this near simultaneous rise of interest of Hindi movement and Brahmo movement um, um, in Islam at a particular junction of reformist or nationalist movement? Also, uh, the linguistic choices are very interesting. Did these choices shape the way Bhadralok impressed upon the shaping of standard Bangla as opposed to the not so pure Muslimani Bangla? Yes, um, very important uh, issues, and thank you for those two questions. There was, um, and I, I did not have time to discuss in detail, but there was a, a linkage and an awareness of other reformist movements within the Brahmo Shomaj's world view and their access to different texts, in particular, Keshav Chandra Shen, who was very much aware uh, of other, other reformist movements. But interestingly enough, uh, perhaps ironically, at the time that this set of work had started to rise, the, the uh, focus on Islam by Brahma Shamaj, we also see a concomitant and perhaps parallel focus on um, perhaps uh, almost sidelining Islam in other reformist spaces in the late 19th century. And this occurs within Arya Samaj, um, uh, primarily by the end of the century. But in terms of Hindi, there is an awareness of, by Brahmos of the work that is done, being done by people in Hindi language. And had that continued, perhaps there would have been much more convergence of the Brahmo projects and the Hindi-based projects, but these do, not, these do not find fruition after the early 20th century. So, so from early 20th century, there's a great uh, decline. Um, and we might tie those to various movements, Swadeshi movement, and other uh, movements of conflict that, that stop uh, this force. And I'm sorry, I have to ask about the second question uh, again. Um, it's, uh, also, the linguistic choices are very interesting. Did these choices shape the way Bhadralok impressed upon the shaping of standard Bangla as opposed to the not so pure Muslimani Bangla? Well, yes. Uh, so the idea of there being a Bangla that is not pure is a site of contestation with uh, the very idea of vernacular for any language. And in Bangla, of course, there were those who believed that so-called Musumane Bangla did not count as Bangla. So we would say that there are two results from this uh, moment for Girish Shundar Shen's contribution. One is that a large number of Bangla leaders were able to understand that there were many Muslim readers of vernacular Bangla, as well as consumers of the vast and growing print culture. And this is something that Muhammad Akram Khan, a very important uh, political figure of the early 20th century Muslim uh, activist, he notes this about Girish Chandra Shen. So it is one effect that Bangla readers who are Hindu who primarily who read vernacular Bangla, they are now aware that there is a lot of Mus there are a lot of Muslim readers. But the other uh, other result is again ironic that after Girish Tundar Shen, there are a lot of Muslims who start to translate uh, Quran and to write about uh, Islam, but they do not do so in this way. They use Arabic uh, words because their goal is to make Muslims read Quran in a certain way and to understand the Arabic uh, as opposed to imagine it to be part of Bangla. So that, that is another result. And that, that affects also the later editions. The Islamic Foundation of Bangladesh has produced many editions of Girish Chandra Shin's 
work and they have excised the so-called Bangla, uh, meaning Ishor. They, they claim that is Bangla and they want to use words like Allah in, in place of that. So that is another uh, result. But on the other hand, uh, the net result is that many, many uh, Bangla readers were able to then access uh, Quran after this through other Muslim translators. Okay. Thank you so much for your response. Um, it's almost 11.15 now, and due to paucity of time, if you could just respond uh, to all the questions in the chat box, probably. So you, or, can take, you can take them. You have can five take? Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, ma'am. So I'll just combine these um, questions. So this is from uh, Professor Anuradha Ghosh. Apart from the Qazi Nasrul Islam, can one trace the legacy of Bengali Muslim intellectual contribution to Bengali literature? Then we have another one from uh, Margaret to tell something on the relation between the communities of the Bengali speaking and the Urdu speaking Muslim intellectuals in Calcutta in this years. I'm thinking specifically about Abdul Kalam Azad. And then also we have another question from Professor Hans Harder regarding reservations to translate sacred texts into vernaculars. There are plenty of apologetical remarks also in a Hindu context, example, in Ramayan renderings, famously Tulsidas, in what way is the picture different from Quran translations? Would you like to uh, respond? Thank you for these questions. Uh, they are very important questions and they make me think uh, about these issues as I revise this uh, work. Uh, so about uh, Bangla, Bengali Muslim contributions to literature, the intellectual contributions, I would say, yes, there are Plenty. Um, so there are uh, there are a range of Muslim writers in the early 20th century uh, that are not only writing in the context of Nojul Islam, but they are, let's say, adjacent to these issues. Uh, there's one uh, by the pen name Shiraji, who writes a great deal in the early 20th century, writes about uh, World War One, writes about Turkey, and he's also writing uh, about Muslims throughout the world. And then there are later writers, uh, Akhtar Juman Ilyash, for example, in what is then East Pakistan and then Bangladesh, who trace, in a sense, a lineage back to some founding moments, like Nojul Islam in the 1920s. There's a Bangladesh Muslim Shaitu uh, Shomaj and a society that uh, focuses on literature. And then in the uh, creation of uh, East Pakistan, there are intellectuals like Muhammad Shaidullah, who is a part of the new state of East Pakistan uh, and advocating for uh, the creation of a Bangali Muslim literature in the phase of East Pakistan time. Also referring back to this history of Nojul Islam and of the presence of Islamic themes in literature. I did not mention um, all, all of that, but there is a, a pre-modern history as well that these people are referring to, which I may speak of later if there's time. Um, other questions, I believe about sacred texts, or that, yes, I think in one sense, what is distinctive isn't so much the relationship between the vernacular and the sacred, which as you're implying is there uh, well beyond or before or outside only of this context, but for uh, the context of Islam, there is a uh, uh, condition of the, the idea of Bangla as allegedly not a Muslim language. And this is something that is a part of the, the existential crisis that is brewing of whether or not people who identify as Muslims would see Bangla that way. And that is something that is, I think, distinctive to this context. But it is also shared, I think, in other uh, linguistic uh, cultural uh, formations in Tamil, for example. Um, but here we have a convergence of the rise of print uh, culture and of a very strong reformist um, context that is pushing uh, this work to come about. And that is, I think, uh, distinctive. I believe there's one more, and I'll just ask to please have that uh, repeated. Yes, of course, sure. Um, this is by Margaret. Uh, could you tell something on the relation between the communities of the Bengali speaking and the other speaking intellectuals in Calcutta in this years? I'm thinking uh, specifically about Abdul Kalam Azad, Abdul Kalam Azad. Yes, so that is another very important issue that is relevant to the history of Bangali Muslims 
as literateurs and critics, because in the time of Azad, there is a great interest and openness to uh, Urdu language. Uh, so for someone like uh, Nodrul, who is very comfortable in Urdu language, and in seeing language as a part of a landscape of language, not so much as only a singular separate vernacular, not only for Bengali Muslims, but as a space to enter into where uh, inspiration from Urdu and exposure to Urdu would have been um, natural and, and would have been common. So in the time of Nodrul in 1920s, he and other Bengali Muslim writers are well aware of Urdu and, and, and exposed to it. Some of them are quite good in Urdu. Now, Azad uh, was not, there was a culture of um, uh, Muslim writers in Calcutta and Muslim printers and publishers who, though they, they supported the Bangalore Muslim printing press, did not know Bangla. They, they had no connection to Bangla, but they supported the idea of Muslims uh, and the idea of Muslim print and the idea of a Muslim uh, community. So these all coexisted uh, and they were not intention in 1920s and 1930s. They, them, they are not uh, the conflicts later between Bangla speakers and the proponents of Bangla language and those who saw Urdu as uh, the proponents of a state language in Pakistan. This is not uh, present in the context of 1920s and 30s. Indeed, I would say one person we do not usually associate with this, Fajlul Haq, the great politician, he uh, encouraged uh, Muslim students to learn Urdu in 1920s. And in 1922, he supported a um, provision in, in the government to allow uh, students uh, in Bengal, Muslim students, to have access to Urdu. He wanted uh, them to study Urdu, as opposed to see Bangla uh, in, the, in the way that it became later in the state of Bangladesh. So I would say the intermingling and the presence of multiple languages only bolstered Bangali Muslim access to Bangla and interest in, in, in writing in the language. Thank you so much. Uh, there's, there's so many questions and very interesting questions indeed. But unfortunately, due to a paucity of time, we also have to start the next session or do we have time? Can we uh, take some one or two questions? Um, Navanita, I think uh, uh, Sir okay. can answer those questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We I mean, we wish uh, we could have your so many things more from you and there are so many interesting questions. Um, so uh, if you could just please uh, type them in the chat box. And now I would request uh, Professor Mukesh Ranjan sir, if you'd like to um, uh, speak a few lines and some of uh, this very interesting. Thank questions. you. Thank you so much, Anob. Uh, it was indeed a very uh, interesting and a very wonderful presentation. Uh, Dr. Bose you know, spoke about you know, the historical context of uh, Islam in Bengal. And he very brilliantly, you know, delineated, you know, the emergence of uh, the syncretic, you know, tradition, you know, in, in Bengal. And uh, he went on to talk about, you know, the vernacular tradition, you know, or the vernacular condition, you know, as a model for understanding uh, religion. And uh, he very correctly argued that it has to be in conjunction, you know, with, uh, you know, the studies of, you know, literary studies. Uh, so, uh, you know, combining, you know, religious history and literary history, you know, does uh, uh, kind of uh, contribute uh, to our, you know, uh, understanding. And as he very rightly pointed out, you know, that both uh, vernacularization of Islam and Islamization of Bengal, how they together belong to a framework, uh, the constitution of uh, which, you know, point to the concomitant indispensability of of you know, both the elements. So indeed, it was a very fascinating you know, presentation. I wish you know, we had more time you know, to, to uh, you know, engage you know, uh, the uh, brilliant you know, speaker. And, uh, and uh, I must you know, personally thank you know, Dr. Bose you know, for uh, bringing to the fore uh, the true spirit you know, of uh, the Bengali you know, culture you know, that manifests in the concept of you know uh, sonar you know bangla so thank you so much thank you for your wonderful you know presentation and thank you i thank all the uh, the the presenter uh, the participants you know and also for also the moderator for uh, carrying out you know their work so beautifully thank you
Thank you, Professor Mukesh Sanjan sir, and chairing the session. And thank you, Dr. Bose, for such an enlightening and stimulating session. I mean, the barrage of questions that we have in this chat box speaks for itself how interesting and wonderful it was. And I would also um, thank all the attendees for joining us today. Thank you so much. Over to you, Shish and Minakshi. Uh, thank you, Nabanita. Now we have a break of five minutes, after which we have a session of quite interesting presentation to 